Counting God, Part 9. Uh, we've been looking at the book Counting to God by Douglas L., um, uh, published in 2014 by Attitude Media. It's available online for free. And um, that's what the uh, cover looks like. I understand we have now an order, and pretty soon we'll have an actual hard copy in our midst. But uh, we, we are into part two, the science of belief. And that was chosen deliberately. Kind of reminds you of science and faith, or faith and science. And we're into chapter 11, which is called the technology of life. And uh, the question is asked, how does life work? And the quotation that's given behind that is by Bill Gates, and he says, DNA is biological computer code, only far, far more advanced than anything we have ever built. And the question, of course, is, can you do that by chance? Life is a technological miracle. Life has a digital operating system, futuristic information input and storage technology, information retrieval machines with built-in proofreading, splicing technology, molecular delivery trucks, factories to build needed machines and parts, technology to compress information, shredding technology, replication technology, repair technology, and so much more. We'll look at these and then return briefly to probability to calculate the odds that just one small piece of functional nanotechnology was created by blind chance. To me, the fantastic futuristic technology now known to exist in all life and the overwhelming improbability that even a small piece of this was created by blind chance are the fourth wonder of modern science, the fourth of seven in our count to God. In Charles Darwin's day, 150 plus years ago, the technology of life was unknown. Early microscopes revealed the existence of cells, but they showed little else. The stuff inside cells was called protoplasm. Some of you my age or beyond can remember being taught that. <coughs> and it was thought to be a jelly-like goo that somehow did all of life's work. Nobody knew how or why. It was kind of magical in a way. Cells were homogeneous globs, uh, globules of plasm. That's a quote from Ernst Haeckel. I think if Charles Darwin were alive today and could study the technology now known to exist in all of life, he would agree that all of this technology could not have arisen by pure chance. Although I'm not quite so sure because I think Charles Darwin had a need for the technology to have arisen by chance. Your body has about 30 trillion cells. Some people say one uh, or 10, some people say 100. Each of your 30 trillion cells is like a complex three-dimensional city with libraries, factories, and highways. Here's a biologist, Michael Denton. To grasp the reality of life as it has been revealed by molecular biology, we must magnify a cell a thousand million times until it is 20 kilometers in diameter and resembles a giant airship large enough to cover a great city like London or New York. What we would then see would be an object of unparalleled complexity and adaptive design. On the surface of the cell, we would see millions of openings, like, porthole, like the portholes of a vast spaceship, opening and closing to allow a continual stream of materials to flow in and out. But certain materials. If we were to enter one of these openings, we would find ourselves in a world of supreme technology and bewildering complexity. We would see endless, highly organized corridors and conduits branching in every direction away from the perimeter of the cell, some leading to the central memory bank in the nucleus, and others to assembly plants and processing units. The nucleus itself would be a vast spherical chamber more than a kilometer in diameter, resembling a geodesic dome inside of which we would see all neatly stacked together in order to raise the miles of coiled chains of the DNA molecules. 
A huge range of products and raw materials would shuttle along the manifold conduits in a highly ordered fashion to and from all the various assembly plants in the outer regions of the cell. Your 30 trillion cells are connected by and controlled through a complex communication system. This system tells them when to divide and in some cases when to self-destruct and die. It tells them when and how to work together like the muscles in your body. Muscle cells contain a protein called titan, which works like a spring. Titan is the largest human protein, 34,350 amino acids linked together. Consider the programming needed to coordinate billions of cells in different muscle groups so that these machines move your body at your will. Consider the technology needed to coordinate your muscles with your eyesight so that you can, with relative ease, catch a ball or lift your foot over a rock. I see in the technology of life an absolute wonder. I think if we as a society could somehow see it untarnished, free of the scientism stranglehold, stranglehold we would rejoice at the miracle and bow down, bow our heads to the skill of a master designer. But few see it at all. And most who do have been educated to ignore the obvious. This cannot stand. A time will come, be it 10 years or 100 years from now, when the truth will escape its academic shackles, when the paradigm breaks and the wonder sparkles. Life is not some protoplasmic goo. Life is a technological miracle. Each year reveals greater complexity technology to amaze. Perhaps more than any other era of science in molecular biology, the arrow of scientific progress points directly to a master designer, to God. This was the hardest chapter to write, uh, Doug says, because the wonder of life here is overwhelming. I'm going to focus on life's technology relating to biological information. Between graduate school and theoretical mathematics and law school, I worked for almost two years as a computer programmer. I developed a heightened appreciation from hundreds of mistakes of how the code you put into the computer has to be exactly right. I should probably ask how many of you have programmed. Uh, you can appreciate his uh, insight there. This chapter will vastly oversimplify the technology of life. It could be thousands of pages long, but don't despair, it's not. We won't, in fact, I'm going to cut it back from what he wrote. <coughs> we won't discuss evidence that many mutations are directed mutations, where programming in the cell mutates the organism as needed, and the organism rewrites its own DNA code, uh, which, by the way, happens in the immune system all the time. We won't discuss evidence that organisms store substantial information outside their DNA code. That is the epigenetic, uh, epigenetic uh, information. He's just going to talk about DNA itself. So this is a small piece of what uh, the technology is that builds a cell. To me, the discoveries of the technology of life are the fourth wonder of modern science. Put on your seatbelt, we've only begun. I'm going to hit you with a lot of facts because here God is revealed in the details. If one of the sections below seems dense, feel free to skip it and go to the next. There will be no quiz. But if you have the time and the interest, I promise you wonder aplenty. The central dogma, life's digital operating system, which as it turns out is not quite true, but certainly happens and is largely true. When I was a, program, a computer programmer, I used a language known as Fortran, which incidentally was what I started on. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I punched computer co cards, each with the precise code for one line of instructions. I remember that too. <laughs> yes. I would submit my batch of cards for white-coated technicians, the only people allowed in the room with a huge IBM mainframe, to enter into the computer. Uh, they actually let me inside sometimes, but <laughs> uh, a few hours later, more or less, I would get the results, which were usually gibberish, because even though I thought of myself as a good programmer, it was hard to write perfect instructions. Some of you remember that too. Uh, it was mostly garbage in, garbage out, or gigo as it's known. 
I didn't know how the computer actually processed or choked on my Fortran instructions, but I knew the computer had a sophisticated operating system. As an operating system is a set of instructions or software that controls machine parts, which is hardware, to get the machine parts, that is computer, printer, monitor, etc., to do what you want, you have to enter information in the form specified by the operating system. Information in the form the operating system is designed to recognize. Those of you who look at your cell phones, can you imagine how many person hours that represents in making it so that you can enter stuff without messing the entire thing up? It's incredible. Human beings have designed a variety of operating systems, and they generally change and get more sophisticated over time. Operating systems for copying and playing back sound from records to 8-tracks to CDs to MP3 files are a good example. CDs and MP3 files are digital systems because the information comes in discrete bits, not in a continuous flow, like older analog TVs or records. Fortran is a digital language. I type discrete letters, numbers, and symbols on cards to be read, which were then punched into discrete holes to be read. A digital operating sy system has a code. It may be binary, ones and zeros, or it may be more complex. All, the, all life has the same advanced digital operating system. All life stores its code in long molecules of DNA. All life has machines that transfer, transcribe DNA information to a slightly simpler molecule called RNA. All life has machines that process the information in RNA to build proteins and other essential molecules of life. This information transfer system, DNA to RNA to proteins, is called the central dogma of molecular biology. It explains how life stores and processes information. It is the operating system of life. How can it be that all life uses the same operating system, runs off the same software pattern, platform? We're going to find out that it's not quite true, and the fact that it's not quite true actually makes it more amazing, but we'll come back to that. Skipping over a little bit. Did you catch that last point? It shocked me, and this is just page two of the big book he was referring to earlier, um, which we skipped over. Simple, one-celled organisms all have molecular machines that can read and process DNA from a s human cell. The vast majority of the 30 trillion cells in our bodies have similar machines that can read and process DNA from bacteria. There is no scientific evidence of a different operating system for life. Actually, there is, and that makes it more amazing, because bacteria and us do have the exact same operating system. It is quite possible the operating system of life sprang into existence with all of its astonishing complexity 3.5 billion years ago and has not changed since that date. Of course, it's also possible it was... Uh, 6,000 years ago and hasn't changed since that date, but we'll let that slide. To me, that is profound. We are, we are bombarded with what I view as unscientific propaganda about the power of evolution, how evolution created everything, shapes everything, and constantly refines everything. The college textbook containing the quotation above, which in a crude sense is a sort of the Bible of molecular biology, repeatedly claims that evolution did this or refined that. Yet you can sense the astonishment of even these worshippers of neo-Darwinian theory that the operating system of life has not evolved. That it appears somehow inexplicably to have arisen fully formed, fully developed, and fully sophisticated. Think of it, uh, we're going to enter into the view of evolutionists, which of course includes time at this point. What it means is, that, as he will put it a little bit, think of it in the language of modern technology. Compare human beings with 30 trillion exquisitely interconnected cells to the most primitive bacteria. We have astonishing added hardware, legs, arms, hearts, eyes, ears, and so on and on. We have amazing apps, all of our senses, muscle coordination, subconscious regulatory processing, and the killer app of all existence, human consciousness and reason. Yet we have the same operating system as the bacteria. 
we and that bacteria and all life run off life one, life 1.0, designed 3.5 billion years ago. Again, it may not have been designed that long ago, but think of it as trying to think of how it would have happened that the first operating system was the best. Now, you may question, was it really the best? We're going to come to that. This undisputed fact is a problem for Darwinists, and they seek to blunt it by proposing an RNA world before the development of, of DNA. RNA has a simpler backbone, one sugar unit instead of two, and they propose a single strand of code instead of the double helix. But the RNA world proposal has major flaws, as noted by Stephen Meyer in Signature in the Cell. RNA building blocks break down in water. RNA building blocks are hard to synthesize and easy to destroy. Well, actually, DNA is a little bit harder to synthesize, but it's a whole lot harder to destroy. RNA molecules can perform only a few of the thousands of functions per performed by proteins. There is no known way RNA could have evolved simultaneously into the DNA and the hundreds of proteins necessary to run life's operating system, which, by the way, is the point at which Eugene Koonin threw up his hands and said, I quit. We can't do this on evolution alone or chance alone. The RNA world proposal derives from philosophic discomfort, not science. Emphasize that point. We're on the science side. They're the philosophically driven people. RNA world proponents are like the steady state proponents of the mid-1900s. A group of scientists, Fred Hoyle was one, who invented a theory of matter being created out of nothing to blunt the philosophical implications of Hubble's law and the creation of the universe in a single Big Bang. There was no scientific evidence that matter could be created out of nothing. The steady state blatantly violated the first law of thermodynamics, the law of conservation of mass and energy. Similarly, today's RNA world proponents disregard scientific flaws to propose, with no evidence, a simpler coding structure in the origin of life. They do this solely because of their philosophical discomfort with the scientific evidence that the incredibly elegant DNA code and all of the sophisticated machinery to process it were fully formed when life began. Uh, by the way, you could call this actually an extension of the last chapter, and you would be fair. <laughs> Skipping on, DNA futuristic information technology. As a programmer, I typed information on cards to be read by the computer. Life reads information off mole on molecules of deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. Let's see how modern science solved the riddle of DNA. I'm going to just give you a little bit of it, and then we're going to skip over that part. Um, experiments in the early 1940s suggested DNA contained the information of life, the instructions for life. When DNA of smooth, lethal bacteria was removed, purified, and added to similar rough, non-lethal bacteria. The rough bacteria were transformed into smooth, lethal bacteria. Scientists concluded that somehow the information to build smooth bacteria was contained in DNA. But exactly what was DNA and how did it store and pass on information? And then there follows the story of Watson and Crick, which we won't go into. If, you li if you'd like to read the story, the book is available online. I suggest you do look at it. Um, DNA is the superstar molecule of life. We know DNA holds the instructions, the code for all life. Every living thing, every bacteria, fungus, plant, and animal has in the majority of its cells an enormously complex DNA molecule or molecules that specify by a precise sequence of the four nucleotides the code to build that organism. The illustration below shows the structure of DNA and the related molecule RNA. And we're going to... Uh, I thought we were going to show you. Maybe it's the next one. Yes. There's the illustration below. And you can see in RNA, it's only a single strand. In DNA, it's a complex double strand that all matches. 
in DNA, you have thymine as your one of your uh, bases. In uh, RNA, you have uracil, which the only difference is the methyl group on the five position of thymine. And uh, uh, everything else is exactly the same. Now let's go back to, according to Michael Denton, DNA and RNA may be uniquely fil fit for their respective biological roles. DNA is small because the code is written with groups of atoms. When an item gets smaller in each dimension, the space needed to hold it goes down dramatically by the cube of the shrinkage. The letters of DNA are less than one millionth the size of the letters in this book. Scientists have been eyeing DNA, uh, eyeing up DNA as a potential storage me uh, mechanism medium for a long time for the three very good reasons. It's incredibly dense. You can store one bit per base, and a base is only a few atoms large. It's volumetric, beaker, rather than planar, as a hard disk. And it's incredibly stable, where other bleeding edge storage me mediums need to be kept in sub-zero vacuums. DNA can survive for hundreds of thousands of years in a box in your garage. And by the way, it also survives better than your CD. Your CD will gradually deteriorate with time and pretty soon will become unreadable. Um, I don't know what the estimated range is, but probably in something of the order of 25 years or so. Uh, the above article from August 2012 reported that scientists were able to store information in DNA so compact that a single gram could contain 700 terabytes of data or the equivalent of 14,050 gigabyte Blu-ray discs in a droplet of DNA that would fit on the tip of your pinky. Michael Denton calculated in 1996 that a mere spoonful of DNA could store the complete instructions for every species that has ever existed with enough room left over to store every book ever written. Scientists are now working to, destroy, uh, to store information in synthetic DNA. How ironic that DNA, the dream information storage technology of our future, is 3.5 billion years old. At least started when life started. The DNA strands in your 30 trillion cells are about two billionths of a meter in diameter. If the DNA in just one of your cells were magnified five million times so that it was just one centimeter in diameter, like light rope, and laid end to end, it would measure 6,000 miles, or the distance from Los Angeles, California, across the entire Pacific Ocean to Seoul, South Korea. At that magnification, a typical cell would have the size of a sphere about 800 feet in diameter. And inside that sphere would be 6,000 miles of light rope, very carefully coiled and stored. Just as in a book, any letter can appear in any space, so too in DNA, any chemical letter can appear at any place. DNA is the code for life, and the code is not generated by any physical or chemical property. Very important. There is no law that's going to make it go that way. In language, there are rules of spelling and grammar that tell us what combinations make sense. And DNA has roughly analogous rules. But with both a book and DNA, the creative process starts fresh with a blank st slate. You can print anything you want on the page. This proves that life is not an inevitable or automatic consequence of the laws of nature. Just as there is no natural law that compels the existence of a work of Shakespeare, so too there is no natural law that compels the writing of working DNA, a working code for life. I started my journey with a vague sense that DNA was some sort of code. I learned that, in the words of Bill Gates, DNA is biological computer code, only far, far more advanced than anything we have ever built. Information retrieval technology. Information retrieval technology is in all life. The evidence suggests it existed when life was first created. This is the original cells. As we have seen, DNA stores information that cells use to build the parts they need. 
These parts are mostly proteins, and the stretch of DNA that contains the code to build a particular protein is called a gene. The central dogma tells us the path from DNA to protein has an intermediate step. The code in the DNA is read and copied, or called transcribed, into an intermediate information molecule called messenger RNA. So the three steps of the central dogma, life's operating system, are one, DNA, two, two, messenger RNA, two, three, proteins. Let's look at how cells go from step one to step two. To read DNA, the double helix has to be opened up to exactly the right section and unzipped so that a single strand can be read. Think of going to the library and making a copy of a page in the book. You want to take information out of a library but can't take the book out? You go in, find the right book, open it to the right page, copy the information you need, put the book back together, and then take the information outside. The process of reading or transcribing or retrieving information from DNA works roughly the same way. Let's talk machinery. All life has in each cell an incredible machine called RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase moves along DNA, unwinds it, unzips the double helix, copies the four-letter code, and puts the double helix back together. It has over 100 parts, which are proteins, any one of which had to be made before, all of which actually had to be made before it would work. RNA polymerase is life's information retrieval machine. It captures the information in a single strand of DNA and loads it into a created molecule of messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is a single strand of information. It is basically a copy of the chemical code, the four chemical letters A, T, C, T, and G of DNA. One of the letters is chemically altered, the T into U, in messenger RNA, but it doesn't affect the analysis, and we will ignore that detail going forward. RNA stands for ribonucleic acid, and it is very similar to a single strand of DNA, although its backbone is less strong. It's actually nice, because when you want to tear it apart again after you're all done, it's easier to do. The biological term for this information retrieval and copying process is called transcription because each base corresponds one to one. We'll get translation in a little bit where the correspondence is not one to one. RNA polymerase builds messenger RNA precisely. On average, it makes about one error in every 10,000 DNA letters. If you were transcribing a book with this accuracy, there would be on average one letter wrong about every five pages. If you've ever written things down, you understand how difficult that is. RNA polymerase has a built-in proofreading mechanism. In some cases, it backs up, cuts out a bad letter or a section, and starts transcribing again. Because DNA is a helix that makes a complete turn about every 10 letters, there's a coiling problem. The DNA of all life gets twisted as it is unwound. You know, Imagine it as a strand of rope that's twisted along, and then you try to pull the parts of the rope apart, and all of a sudden you find that that the areas on either side start getting twisted tighter. Another special biological molecular machine solves this coiling problem. It takes two strands of DNA, cuts a complete break in one of them, passes the uncut DNA strand through the cut strand, and then reseals the cut DNA strand. It does this exactly as needed. All this sounds incredibly fantastic. Modern science proves it to be true. Helicase. The process is more complex than eukaryotic cells, cells with a nucleus. The step from bacteria to cells with a nucleus may have been a greater step in complexity than the first step to create life. Well, probably in terms of absolute complexity, certainly not relative, but... An average mammalian cell is 2,000 times larger than the bacterial E. coli. Bacterial DNA is contained in a geometrically simple loop, although not a short loop. The DNA of E. coli has 4.6 million letters. In cells with a nucleus, the DNA is coiled on spool-like combinations of proteins 
called nucleosomes, not to be confused with nucleotides, which are the groups of atoms that contain the letters of DNA. To re it's all Greek, by the way. Um, to retrieve information from a eukaryotic cell, the RNA polymerase has to move through the complex chromatin structure, discussed in more detail below, unwind the DNA off the nucleosome, nucleosome spools, unzip the double helix, manufacture a molecule of RNA with the same chemical code, and reconstruct the DNA. Zip it back up, put it back on the nucleosome spools, put the chromatin fiber back together. Eukaryotic cells have three different types of RNA polymerase machines. Splicing technology. Human beings and other advanced forms of life come with splicing technology. After RNA polymerase retrieves the information from a section of DNA to create a long molecule of messenger RNA, other machines cut and splice the good sections together in just the right way to construct a finished product that is the code for whatever protein the ce that cell has decided to build. Many genes can be spliced in different ways to build different proteins sometimes thousands of different proteins. This technology reduces the DNA code needed. About 75% of human genes have this ability called alternate splicing to encode more than one protein. And think of it this way, all those little hairs inside of your ear, each one of here is a slightly different tone. That's all done with splicing so that you have one giant gene instead of 350 or 500 or however many uh, separate genes. The splicing machinery requires five RNA molecules and over 200 proteins. Some of the sections that have to be sliced out can be as long as 100,000 RNA letters. So the splicing machine, called a spliceosome, has to be extremely accurate. It contains its own proofreading machinery. Exactly how it all works is not fully understood, so I'm not going to go into the, some of the speculations about that. Titan, that spring-like protein in your muscles we mentioned before from uh, 3, 000, uh, pardon me, 34,350 amino acids linked together. In order to get that protein, the code to build that protein, your spliceosomes cut out and carefully splice together 363 sections of messenger RNA. This is science fact. The theory that all this arose by chance is science fiction. Molecular delivery trucks. Think of all the steps and all the information it takes to get a package to your front door. <laughs> Cells with a nucleus have technology to escort finished RNA through the membrane of the nucleus. Special proteins, technically called nuclear pore complexes, attach to finished RNA molecules, transport them through the membranes of the nucleus, deliver them to factories called ribosomes, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, release the RNA, and then re-enter the nucleus to transport more RNA. They're molecular shuttle service, biological trucks. Questions? At this point, you may have questions. I sure did. How does a cell know when it needs to build a particular machine part, a particular protein? How does a cell know where to find the instructions, the gene, for that particular machine part, uh, or protein in your 33.2 billion letters of human DNA. After the gene is copied onto messenger RNA, how does the cell know exactly which sections of that messenger RNA are good, and how does it cut out only the good sections and learn know how to splice them together in exactly the right order to get the codes for the machine part or protein it needs? Good questions. Assessing the correct part of DNA is called gene expression. Gene expression is complex and not completely understood. A lot of this stuff is not completely understood. I'll give you a clue. The DNA that does not contain a gene, the 98.5% of your DNA that is non-coding, seems to be where this information is kept. That was a stunning announcement in September 2012 by 450 scientists working together on the ENCODE project. We'll come back to the ENCODE project in the next chapter Stay tuned for next week as we look at the myth of junk DNA. Allow me to share more of the technology of life, molecular factories. So now the proper section of DNA, the correct gene, has been opened up and the information transcribed into messenger RNA. In eukaryotic cells, that 
cells with a nucleus, the messenger RNA may have been correctly spliced as well. In eukaryotic cells, the messenger RNA has been transported outside the nucleus. The cell is finally ready to build a biological machine part, a protein. Proteins are by far the most structurally complex and functionally sophisticated molecules known, including ones that we create ourselves. I find this next step mesmerizing. It is highly logical, highly organized, and screams of design. When I first read how it works, I was puzzled because it seemed that anyone who knew about this process should believe in God. Your cells contain factories called ribosomes that read the code in messenger RNA and construct the proteins necessary for life. The ribosome is an awesome assembly plant, an ancient molecular juggernaut made up of two ch main chains of RNA and more than 50 different proteins precisely assembled. Basically, the RNA is kind of like a skeleton and everything else fits on, but the RNA has some functional parts too. All life has ribosomes that work roughly the same way. A human ribosome can read the code and DNA from a bacterium to assemble the protein a bacteria needs, and a bacterial ribosome can read the code from humans to assemble the proteins humans need. Now that's part of the function of life being run on uh, operating system 1.0. The genetic code. The ribosome reads the code three letters at a time. With four letters, there are four by four by four, that is 64, three-letter combinations. Each tells the ribosome to start, to add a particular amino acid to the protein it is building, or to stop. The ribosome begins by reading the first three letters of the messenger RNA. It knows which of the 20 possible amino acids that particular three-letter code refers to. And it knows because it has a code system, but it doesn't look like a table, of course, like this. Here's your start code, and that's always in bacteria. Again, apparently, there's some uh, that use valine uh, GUG as well as AUG for starter. But most of the time, it, it starts on methionine. And you can see, uh, notice that there are large blocks that are the same. That for alanine, if you specify the first two letters, the last letter doesn't really matter. That's nice because then if something happens to mutate the last letter, it doesn't really matter either. That's a very good feature of the code. You can't do that perfectly. You notice that tryptophan has only one, methionine has only one, and everything else has at least two different ways of writing the code. Paul, does it make any logical sense that the first two letters would be uh, the same for each uh, amino acid? Does it make what sense? Does it make logical sense that the first two uh, with letters would, would uh, be associated with the amino acid versus the first and third or the second third? Well, actually, it does make sense. The most important base is the second one. Uh, that in honor of uh, Abbott and Costello is what? Who's the first one? Um, uh, and I don't know is the third one, which means that you, you can pick whichever one you want. Um, but uh, the, if you think of the three bases coming down, the center one is the one that's the most important one. It's the one that's going to match the most. The thir first one matches a little bit less carefully. The third one is harder to match. So yes, it does make a difference which one, whether it's the second one rather than the, uh, the you know, if you had the first and third and the second one didn't matter, that would actually make, uh, be difficult to do. It's almost like it was designed that way. As messenger RNA rolls through the molecular factory, the ribosomes read the code three letters at a time, pull out the correct amino acid. Of course, the ribosome has a supply of amino acids for building proteins, and they're already attached to their transfer factors, and adds it to the string. Sort of like you might build the necklace by snapping together plastic beads or building a sentence by typing letters and spaces. 
It would take a separate book to fully describe the wonders of the genetic code. I'll briefly note three. First, the 20 amino acids that form the alphabet of light that are assembled in various ways to form proteins appear to have been selected very carefully. A 2011 study compared life standard alphabet of 20 amino acids for, quote, size, charge, and hydrophobicity, that is aversion to water, with equivalent values calculated for a sample of one million alternative sets, each also comprising 20 members drawn randomly from the pool of 50 plausible prebiotic candidates. Why didn't they test it against all possible ones? Because you couldn't do that in one person's lifetime. It would take too much work. But they can say that our code is better than one in a million. The two NASA astrobiology scientists who conducted the study found, quote, the standard alphabet exhibits better coverage, that is, greater breadth and greater evenness than any random set that they tested. The standard alphabet was better than any of the one million randomly chosen possible sets of 20 amino acids. They conclude the standard set of 20 amino acids represents the possible spectra of size, charge, and hydrophobicity more broadly and more evenly than can be explained by chance alone. Life just won the lottery. Second, the genetic code in the way it maps the, 300, uh, the 64 three-letter DNA combinations to life's alphabet of 20 amino acids is a marvel of error correction and error minimization technology. Remember that for many of those amino acids, the third position didn't matter. You could mutate it all day long and, it, and, and uh, you wouldn't change a thing in terms of how, uh, what the protein was coding for. <coughs> A complex statistical study found it highly optimal because it significantly outperformed one million randomly chosen alternative codes. Third, there is no known way the genetic code, code could have evolved. Here's again Eugene Koonin, senior investigator at the National Center for Biotechnology Information, National Library of Medicine, National Institutes of Health, and he recognized experts in the field of evolutionary and computational biology with co-author Artem uh, Novozilov in 2009. Those of you who were here last week will remember the name Eugene Koonin. Summarizing the state of the art in the study of the code evolution, we cannot escape considerable skepticism. It seems that the two-pronged fundamental question, why is the genetic code the way it is and how did it come to be, that was asked over 50 years ago at the dawn of molecular biology might remain pertinent even in another 50 years. They don't have an answer. They don't have a clue as to where the answer is. Our consolation is that we cannot think of a more fundamental problem in biology. To me, the genetic code is a miracle. In life's standard alphabet of 20 amino acids and the genetic code's quality of minimizing error and in the difficulty of even remotely conceiving of how one genetic code could possibly, I think that's possibly, uh, evolve into another, I see the hand of a master designer. I cannot believe that the genetic code with all the molecular technology to read it and assemble proteins arose by a chance-based process. It appears that the genetic code was created 3.5 billion years ago. Um, you will notice that uh, Eugene Koonin couldn't believe it either. That's why he invoked multiple universes at this point. Building proteins. Human proteins vary in greatly in length, but a typical human protein has about 430 amino acids. The 20 amino acids used to make proteins all have a central carbon atom to which is attached the ammonia part, the car carboxyl group, and the side chain. These four connections are spaced evenly in three-dimensional space to form a tetrahedron. Because it is a three-dimensional object, each amino acid can be formed in one of two ways, which are mirror images or optical isomers of each other, some like the right and the left hand. 
or if you like the right and the left ear. There is no known law of physics that dictates a preference for one of these mirror images shapes over the other. Yet almost all of the amino acids in living organisms are left-handed. This fact also made me stop and take a breath. Is it not perhaps evidence of design? Skipping on a little further, information compression technology. Your body has technology to store and compress DNA. Remember that? 6,000 miles of rope that has to be put inside of an 800-foot uh, container. The first step is to wind your DNA on spools with grooves designed to hold it. Each of these spools, called nucleosomes, holds a little less than two wraps, 1.65 turns, or about 147 letters, of DNA. There is linker DNA between these spools, so there's a nucleosome for about every 200 letters of DNA. The nucleosomes are precisely contoured to hold your DNA tightly. In each 142 hydrogen bonds, where a hydrogen atom shares an electron with an adjoining atom, and other chemical reactions hold on to the backbone of your DNA. And by the way, hydrogen bonds are uh, quantum mechanical phenomena. Uh, the next step is to arrange nucleosomes to form a chromatin fiber. This fiber has repeating zigzag arrays of nucleosomes going back and forth. Your DNA is most compact when your cell is ready to reproduce. At this stage, it has somehow been uh, compacted another 50 times so that it is almost 10,000 times as compact as a single strand of DNA. If you came across systems half as complex in any other setting, you would know they had been designed. The belief that they're not designed is theologically motivated. Shredding technology. Unused or waste RNA is dangerous. It is shredded by disposal machines called exosomes, which exist in all life. There is a hollow barrel made up of nine proteins. RNA is channeled down the barrel to reach a tenth protein called a catalytic subunit, which shreds the DNA, breaks it all into little tiny pieces. Cells lacking any of the ten proteins do not survive in this barrel. So if you, if you have uh, nine but not the tenth one, or, or nine but not the fifth one, Cells lacking any of the 10 proteins do not survive. And this shows that not only the catalytic subunit, but also the entire barrel is critical to, for the function of the exosome. Exosomes appear to be irreducibly complex, a concept we will look at in the next chapter. So we're going to go to Behe, among other things. Replication technology. Replication, replicating 3.2 billion letters of DNA in one of your cells is quite a feat. The replication technology is fundamentally similar to bacteria and complex life, and in each it is accurate to about one letter in a billion. If the error rate were 10 times greater, say one mistake in every 100 million DNA letters copied, evolution would probably have stopped at an organism less complex than a fruit fly. Uh, might not have happened at all. I found this description of how it, I'm skipping over a few, and I need to give replication technology in the, uh, uh, for what it is, works for E. coli, helpful. If the DNA strand were magnified to have a diameter of one meter, the replication machinery, think of a DNA, okay, like so, um, the replication machinery would be the size of a Federal Express truck. Move down the line at 375 miles per hour and make a mistake about once every 100 miles. That is really good replication. Keep in mind this machinery synthesizes both new chains simultaneously. And I'm skipping over Okazaki fragments and the fact that one of them has to be synthesized backwards. It's just crazy. DNA has to be maintained. Spontaneous chemical reactions alone change about 5,000 letters of DNA each day in each cell. If left untreated, these changes would create an unacceptable rate of mutation. Cells that have different types 
cells have different types of in incredible repair machines that fix more than 99.9% .9 of all DNA damage. If you don't have them, many human diseases, colon cancer, skin cancer, leukemia, breast, ovarian, prostate cancers, stunted growth, and others have been linked to problems with DNA repair. And by the way, decreased mentation too. You do not need a PhD in molecular biology to appreciate the wonder of the technology of life. I realize that no matter how many incredible machines and processes are described to them, many people will not be able to see outside of the prevailing paradigm. Darwinists claim all this technology, all the incredible machines and processes in our bodies and other forms of life arose from accidental mutations and natural selection. I see the hand of a master designer. To me, the discoveries of the technology of life are the fourth wonder of modern science. Return to probability. Consider the protein, the biological machine part called histone H4. It's one of the four different proteins used in pairs to build the spool, the nucleosomes, around which the DNA of eukaryotic cells is wrapped. Each of your cells has about 30 million nucleosomes and therefore about 60 million copies of the protein known as each of your cells, and there's trillions of cells, of course, and therefore about 60 million copies of the protein known as histone H4. Histone H4 is relatively short, 102 amino acids folded exactly right. In biological terms, histone H4 is highly conserved. How highly conserved? Perhaps because of its key role in holding and releasing DNA, histone H4 has changed or evolved little in hundreds of millions of years. Of the 102 amino acids, 100 are the same in a pea and a cow. We're talking precise. This isn't 25% variability. This is 2% variability. It appears that the particular order of these 100 amino acids is essentially for this vital piece of cellular machinery to function properly. Well, almost, and we'll come to that. It's even more interesting. It has been proven that almost all changes in the amino acid sequences of histones are lethal or cause serious abnormalities, and that part is definitely true. It is not hard to estimate the odds that accidental processes even given an ample supply of the 20 amino acids necessary to build proteins, would accidentally create a single copy of histone H4. To simplify, what are the odds of getting, by dumb blind luck, a specified sequence of 100 amino acids? We'll toss the other two out. When we are done linking 100 amino acids, the odds that we did it correctly are 1 in 20 multiplied by itself 100 times, or 1 in 20 to the 100. Now, 1 in tw uh, 20 to the 100 is a monster number. It is about the same size as 1 in 10 to the 130. 1 in a number with 130 zeros. We're down 130 levels in our magical building of chapter 10 within sight of Dem Dembski's universal probability limit of 1 in 10 to the 150, and this is just one protein. And even if the odds of 1 in 10 to the 130 were overcome somehow, and a copy of histone H4 was created by accident, you've only begun. To build a single nucleosome, you need to start with two copies of the histone H4 and six other proteins, as well as the information to put those parts correct, together correctly. You just, you've won your universal lottery now four times, as well as the information to put these parts together correctly. To use nucleosomes, you need technology to wind and unwind DNA off the spools. Nucle nanotechnology is technology built at the atomic level. Functional nanotechnology, such as technology for coiling and assessing DNA on nucleosomes, does not arise by accident. It doesn't matter how many Earth-sized planets are out there or how many billions of years have elapsed. You still have no plausible chance of creating functional nanotechnology. That is a mathematical truth, not a religious statement. You can't get functional biological nanotechnology, both the organic machines and the technology to operate them, by any mechanism involving only blind chance. Any person who thinks otherwise does so 
based on materialism slash scientism slash atheist beliefs, not because of science. We have now countered to God through four wonders of modern science, creation, the fine tuning of the universe, the origin of life, and the technology of life. We will count to five as we look at the puzzles of macroevolution, the creation of radically new forms of life. So stay tuned for next week. My take on all this, I liked Eglisell's presentation. That's why we spent so much time on it. If there is a fault, it is that he's made it too simple, which it's hard to avoid in a system as complex as life. Sometimes the argument is even stronger than he says. For example, there are some histones that still work uh, that have more differences than just the two. Which raises the question of why the pea and the cow have H4 histones within two amino acids of each other. And by the way, the human as well. Even when it doesn't appear to be biologically mandated. With all of that time for evolution, why didn't we have wider range in histones? Why are we zeroing on these ones? The same is true for the genetic code. It is true that we have the same genetic code as bacteria, but the paramecium and our own mitochondria have different codes from the standard code. Let me illustrate. In the paramecium, these codes that normally work for stop don't work for stop. Instead, they work for glutamine, which is down here, by the way. Why? To to make the point, you know, I think Walter Humayn may be right. God deliberately did it just so that we would have to accept that evolution is not the answer. Because, and, and our own mitochondria have, instead of those two changes, well, they have this one changed, um, and these two, instead of arginine, become stop codes. And this one becomes tryptophan. And this one becomes methionine. You know what that means? That's like saying that when you get to certain letters, suddenly you're going to change every A to a G. Can you imagine what that would do? Or in the case of some of this, you're going to change periods into letters. Can you imagine what that would do if you're trying to read something? That means the code is that we have that is usually th thought of as universal and, it, and is mostly is not the only one that could have evolved because others did happen. Why did we get an optimal code the first time? Beyond that, how does one evolve the paramecium from some other organism? Not only the code mechanism must be updated, so must the source code in the nucleus to begin with. That is, you have to go through and all of those ones that used to be stop codes and were working just fine, you have to change them into the only stop code that now works. Randomly, without any editor, Now, I uh, got an email from George Javor, and I'm going to share some pieces of it because I have to be fair. Uh, he talks about the uh, label release experiments of the Viking. This is from two weeks ago, which gave the initial impression that there's microbial activity in the Martian soil. However, because the mass spectrometer results showed conclusively that there was no organic material in the soil, how do you get life with no organic material? The final conclusion of the results was that there had to be a non-biological reason. And indeed, when they did some further experiments on, I am assuming he means perchlorates, uh, UV-activated per perchlorates, which are quite rich in, in the Martian soil, they were able to reproduce the experiments without life. So that part we may have... Uh, skipped over a, uh, a, uh, a uh, controversy. Um, uh, 
again, uh, George Lavore comments that Douglas L, I, I think that's a mis mistype, thinks that viruses are living entities. Of course, being a mathematician, you would not pick up on such a minute detail, but I didn't correct it. Um, uh, viruses are complex or, uh, things, whatever they are, uh, and it depends on how you define life. Certainly, they're related to living organisms, uh, but y you could make the argument that they're not living by themselves. Uh, and then that raises the question of how far up the chain of parasites one goes before one insists that we call it life. Um, and finally, the big, po uh, the big point, and again, I think he had the uh, wrong uh, last name. It seems to me everyone in else, including yourself, seems to think that the argument against chemical evolution is overwhelming improbability of complex proteins or RNAs coming into existence spontaneously on a hypothetical primordial Earth. The implication of this line of thinking is that once you have these substances at hand, you're well on your way to generating living cells, etc. Um, he points out if this were true, we could easily create living cells by procuring all the necessary complex biopolymers from formerly living matter. The reason we cannot create living matter rests in our inability to put a cell together where the chemical reactions uh, within are not in equilibrium. Life processes depend on the ongoing chemical transformations in steady state uh, non-equilibrium. She once reviewed my chapter in Understanding Creation by, uh, edited by Gibson and Rossi, and he's correct in that. Um, and I probably should make that point as well. And that is that even if you have all of the DNA, all of the RNA, all of the proteins, everything else you could want, and you mix them up, you do not have life. You have to have it organized in some way that we don't fully understand. If that were not the case, uh, one would expect uh, chickens to come out of Campbell's chicken soup uh, cans. Um, however, to be fair to Douglas L., I think that the arguments that he is making are minimalist arguments. That is, they're kind of akin to coming up to someone who boasts he can jump over the Grand Canyon and then just ask him to jump a 100-foot gorge or between two 100-foot lines so he won't hurt himself on the way down and watch and see what he can do. If you can't jump a 100 feet, you're not going to get across the Grand Canyon. Come on, guys. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. In some ways, there isn't much else to say, I guess. <laughs> I, and and th think of it. This is just the start. Yeah, we have a comment back here. Go ahead and pass the mic back. Uh, yeah, it, um, to me, uh, one of the interesting things here is that so much of this is absolutely essential. How did life ever get started without the editing uh, and correcting mechanism, uh, which he discussed for quite a while there? Well, more uh, precisely, how did life continue if it got started? It, uh, you can't. You can't reproduce any DNA about that. I mean, you gotta. Uh, well, I mean, you can, but it but won't not, work. But not enough, not enough accuracy. Yeah, yeah. it's it's uh, a huge it's problem. Uh, you have to have so many complex systems together at the same time. It's, it's just overwhelming. Well, that's what I say. Eugene Coonan has finally let the cat out of the bag. Look, you give, as he puts it, ridiculously liberal assumptions. And the mathematics is just horrible. And that's why the people who defend this theory say, no, you can't do the mathematics, because they know that if you do the mathematics, they're hung. Anyway.
how fast is all this happening in the cell? You know, there, you find an error, you got to fix the error, you got to write a new code, you got to splice together. Uh, I mean, well, there are bacterial cells that will reproduce themselves completely, not just do all this DNA stuff, but collect enough body material to to add new material to everything in 10 minutes. It is incredible how fast those things can grow. Now, 20 minutes is, is, is nice, leisurely pace, right? Yeah, I mean, we, it, it is amazing how fast those things will, will collect all of this stuff. You know, you try doing that as a, as a research chemist. You know, stuff that we take uh, two or three days to do, they do, you know, in a couple of seconds. Just the right amount, just the right proteins to make it, you know, well, I mean, within 10%, but who cares? I mean, it's, it, the, the accuracy is astounding. If you, if you do organic chemistry, you realize that 10% error is pretty good. 90% yield, I'll take that, thank you very much. Yeah. It's just amazing. Go ahead. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to ask this question, but is is there a would there be a way to determine how long this machinery for life has been in existence based on entropy? Can you measure some type of entropy in the system and look back and say once you get past a certain point, this stuff won't function anymore? Actually. Yes, there is. Um, estimates of that have been made by um, a world-class geneticist at Cornell by the name of John Sanford. It's called genetic entropy, and it suggests that uh, even with all of those amazing technological marvels that keep our DNA from deteriorating, that we're coming to the point where in another thousand years, um, maybe less than that. Uh, we won't function as reproductive machines anymore. We won't be able to have kids. Uh, if you look at the what is happening to our uh, our societal pressures, it may happen even faster than that. Nobody wants to have kids anymore. Um, I mean, you look at the you look at the rate of, of reproduction in uh, much of the developing world, and it's um, in a doubling time is what ten, twenty years, something like that. Um, in in uh, America, we're leveling off t t uh, from that, and in uh, Europe the population size is actually going down. There are less kids than there are parents. And that's a huge strain on a welfare society because what it means is that there aren't enough people working to sustain all the old people that are expecting to, to get um, help in their old age. So if we're not going to be able to reproduce in uh, theoretically another thousand years, what does that say looking back in time? How, how far have have these machinery, you know, mechanical systems been around then? Well, actually, that's <laughs> the question that... That's what I'm uh, trying to get him that, to say. Th that's the question that John Sanford raised. And his answer is that deep time, that is millions of years, is not really a viable option. Hasn't he written a book? about all this? Yes, he has. Genetic in case you're entropy. interested, you can look And in it fact, up. if you go back far enough in our series, we reviewed that book once in some detail. So how uh, far back can you go? 
probably somewhere between thousands and hundreds of, uh, and a hundred thousand years. Probably under a hundred thousand years is quite reasonable. Um, what that means is that a species that lives for 10 million years is just, it's asking us to believe the implausible. And it's implausible multiplied over because there are dozens of species where if you believe the standard geologic time scale, you're going to wind up uh, w exceeding those limits. Dr. Geem, I, I believe he is a short age creationist, isn't he? He is a short age creationist, so and partly because of this. You know very what problem. he thinks. This is, uh, this is a really important point. Uh, the, the point that he raises is, is like this, if you want to think of it by analogy. You're standing on a bridge looking at a river flowing by you. The river is flowing at 20 miles an hour. There's a water strider on the river, and it can swim in any direction semi-randomly at uh, a tenth of a mile an hour. As you're watching the water strider, th there are two conclusions you can make. Number one, he didn't get there by swimming upstream. <laughs> and number two is there's no way he's going to avoid the falls that are 500 feet down the road or down the river. And it puts the punctuation mark on the point that will be na made next week, and that is that evolution couldn't do it even under optimal circumstances. What, what, um, uh, what Sanford is pointing out very specifically is that these are not optimal circumstances. That while you are trying to evolve stuff, the ground under you is crumbling. You can't make it. And that means that you didn't get there by building it up. And it means that if you wait long enough, the whole thing is going to disappear. And that's just the scientific facts. Unless something happens to change that, that's where we're headed, number one. And number two, we didn't get there by the slow process of evolution. It's not fast enough to get over genetic entropy itself. Now that's not a point that Douglas L. would put out in his book. What I'm saying is Douglas L. is giving you a minimalist interpretation. Supposing you accept <coughs> all of this stuff, it still doesn't work. Well, the fact of the matter is you shouldn't accept it in the first place. The evidence on life in general, on the origin of life, on the continuation of life, on the diversification of life, is solidly against anything without some kind of intelligent design. Now, could a creator miraculously create species one at a time? Well, yes, that could happen. But already you have breached the materialist paradigm. The point of it is atheism won't wash. And that's not a biased statement. That's just a statement of fact. Scientific. <laughs> Scientific fact if you want. Now, once you get past atheism, then you can ask, well, what does work? And then it's perfectly reasonable to start looking at alternative modules, models. But every single one of them is going to have an intervener who is interested in life's existence and life's development. And, you know, uh, this six-day creation in Genesis is one of those models you're going to have to seriously consider. Because you can't throw it out now by just simply saying, but it's against materialist dogma. Because I'm sorry, life is against materialist dogma. We are, we have gotten to God. 
we have countered to God, or if you prefer, um, uh, which your, your book was t entitled um, Science Discovers God, Science Has Discovered God. There's no two ways about it. I mean, the only way to avoid that is to believe in a, in a universe where anything literally can happen for no reason whatsoever. Interestingly, uh, all this data that's been coming forth here uh, provides no compelling evidence for thinking that this happened three and a half billion years ago instead of a few thousand years ago. That's right. Yes. I want to comment on John Sanford. Um, I know very little about genetics, but I've read parts of his book. I've uh, heard him lecture on this campus. He's been here, I believe. And um, my impression is that you can come up with his results if you establish the rules or logic of thinking. And what he's doing is establishing a rule of being able to predict through uniform rates or conditions. He's looking at rates, rates of change, and you can predict that in a thousand years, um, that's it, using uniform rules. The study here today suggests that God has embedded in this cell a way of counteracting a lot of these genetic problems and correcting mm -hmm. genetic mistakes. And so you have something. I don't know if Sanford has taken that into account, oh. all the evidence that we've seen today. Uh, if he has, he has, it's a masterful yes. work. He oh. has. But I would still disagree with his logic as a creationist because other um, creationists in other disciplines use the same logic of uniform rates. For example, the decay of the Earth's magnetic field. It's going from a higher level of uh, intensity to a lower level, and you can measure it over periods of time. And uh, there's a man named Barnes that has, uh, Tom Barnes has uh, come up with a whole theory on this. And he says the Earth is not more than 10 or 12,000 years if you continue the decay pattern or if you extrapolate back in time, you have an atmosphere or an Earth that is so high powered it would destroy life. So life couldn't exist more than 10 or 12,000 years ago. So he's using the same logic overall as Sanford, but then you have a third situation where with radioactive decay, we can't use uniform extrapolation. Otherwise, we do get the millions and billions of years. So you have a project called the Rate Project by ICR that says, oh, we've got some pretty good evidence that the rates have changed. And there's some samples. I forget if it's Arizona or New Mexico. It's in the Southwest. And they have a two-volume set on this establishing that uniformity doesn't work, the rates have changed. So I have a disconnect just from the philosophy of science. Maybe someday we'll, someone will resolve these apparent discrepancies. I don't know. Well, at this point, we don't have a resolution. Um, I think that what we can fairly say, though, is that from a, a couple of experiments, the standard model doesn't really have a resolution either. That's very true. And very true. while it may not be a full-fledged win for us, I think it is at least a draw. And I think that beyond that, some of the things that are being done suggest that, that at least the hypotheses that are being portrayed give you something to study. Uh, they give you hypotheses to test. Mm -hmm. And some of them have tested extremely well and done much better than those uh, obtained from standard mm -hmm. uh, assumptions. Okay. And so I, I think at that point, you have to at least say that um, 
the worst that we're coming off with is a draw, and we may actually be um, making some headway. Appreciate that. One more comment here, and then one here, and then we'll close. <clears throat> well, maybe just sound ridiculously miraculous at this point. But I think I got John Hanford's book in my back window in my car. I was going. I was going to stay quite a while to be in, and I thought I'd go over it again. So, you want to see what it looks like? Yeah, Barnes and Noble. Yeah. Okay. I was just going to say uh, the, the question of extrapolation from the present to the past is absolutely essential if we're going to ask questions about the past. Uh, there are good extrapolations, there are bad ones. Uh, they demand careful analysis. I think uh, Stanford did take into account uh, the, the uh, correcting process and its figures. I mean, obviously, from, from what he had, that, yeah. the rate of mutation and so on. Uh, so I feel he's got a case here. Well, I, I think we can even point out specifically how he took that into account. There are two ways to take that into account. One of them is the theoretical. You may remember that we make, on the average, about three mistakes every time we correct our DNA. Every person. If you figure that there are perhaps, let's say, 20 generations between the fertilized ovum and the new gene cells uh, that are being put out, then, uh, then that means an average of about 60 mistakes from one person to the next that are brand new to that person. And in fact, if uh, studies that have been done on people measuring their entire DNA, comparing it to their parents and so forth, have shown that depending on which study you're talking about somewhere, and probably depends partly on what these people ate and you know what kind of mitogens are in the food and, and in fact maybe even such things as how much sunlight they got, although probably the food has more to do with it than sunlight does. Um, but, uh, and, and probably also you know whether they live in an area that's rich in radon or various other radioactive elements, whether they do a lot of flying, um, which puts you above the most of the atmosphere and exposes you to cosmic rays and stuff like that. That, so, there, so I don't, I think we can say that it, safely that it shouldn't be an absolutely uniform number, but somewhere between 60 and 120 new mutations per person, per generation if you like. And, and that's. And it's cumulative. Well, exponential. Yeah. Yeah. I, I and think about it. That's your twenty mile an hour current that's just going down. It's irreversible. I don't know how we live six thousand years. <laughs> well, I mean, some of them can be fixed, obviously, but when you count, when you actually measure the amount of of, of genetic decay that happens from person to person, it comes out to be about somewhere between 60 and 120 new mutations every single person. We are flowing down that river. We, and, and natural selection can't swim upstream against the river. Well, it kind of suggests that we're getting worse, doesn't it? Uh, well, we have somewhat leveled off, but I will point out to you a couple of other things, and that is that there is a disease called progeria, where people get to be 11 years old and they, they look old and wrinkled and they get heart disease and it's, it, they, they're old before their time. They have arthritis. They, it's, it's amazing what happens to them. Um, think of it this way.
compared to our progenitors, if you believe the biblical record, we actually have progeria. Just a mild case. You know? That's what we've got. Um, and the other ones are just, you know, one step beyond that. Uh, well, eventually it could, it could turn out that progeria is the fate of the entire civilization. Uh, and I can see it coming down in, you know, steps. But I, I think it's also important to keep in mind that people who have studied the minds of ancients uh, will tell you that their uh, intelligence level is greater than ours on average. We, we do better because we have all these peripheral devices that help supply our memory. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is that in terms of actual sharpness, mental sharpness, we are a shadow of what they used to do. I'd like to speak to longevity since we can easily go into the biblical record. Um, Moses, as you know, lived to be 120. A uh, couple, three, four generations back was Joseph. So we're talking about 1500 to maybe 1700 BC. Um, Joseph lived to be 110. So we have a framework there between 110 and 120. And the world's oldest people are somewhere in, still in that framework. It's like the record got stuck. It keeps repeating. But to find those people, you have to look at 5 billion people. Whereas uh, the number of Israelites, it's in the terms of thousands and not millions or billions. In the case of Joseph, it's 70. <clears throat> so we, yeah, it started out with 70 males. So um, I don't know if you could find anyone from ancient times that lived to be 150. But I well, take the uh, biblical record as giving us a pretty good ballpark figure for well, longevity. Well, Abraham himself, uh, Jacob says, I am only 137 years. That's a mere shadow compared to my forefathers. Yeah, I'm talking about extra biblical evidence. Yeah, naturally, if you go back far enough, you've got hundreds and hundreds of years, which is an enigma to um, sociologists and geneticists. They don't know how to explain that. I don't either. <laughs> this, is, this is interesting, so I, I just needed to make a comment. Hunzaland Adventists yeah. from Loma Linda used to go there. Well, hundred. 30 years was okay. People used to live 157 years till they built a highway through Hunzaland and uh, things changed very quickly. That same thing happened in, uh, um, what's the island? Uh, Naru, Naru Island. Uh, phosphate was found there and overnight their lifestyle changes. So in one generation, 40% of people became uh, diabetics. I just wanted to go to um, Europe, you mentioned. One out of every four couples go to infertility clinic. One out of every four. Why did Merkel do what she did in Germany uh, a couple of years ago? Merkel. She opened up the floodgates there because people are, uh, who is going to take care of the welfare? They need people to support the aging people. And if they're from Syria, so? Right. So what? <laughs> whatever they're doing, but anyways, <laughs> good question. I think that's what's happening to Adventists also. Um, George Knight mentions that uh, median age of uh, Adventists in this country is 58 years old. Now uh, uh, the latest is 65, you know, so are we <laughs> doing what <laughs> is happening to the world? Well, it, it is. Too many burgers? Too many eating. No, maybe we've lost so many generations of young people. Our our church's problem is different from the world's problem. Ch people leaving the church. Yes, big time. 
picked up. I believe that problem is because today we do not know who we are. We were a movement, we became a church, and then we need, we're going to be becoming a movement again. You know, today, oh, no, 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 don't talk about this. Don't talk. I was told by, I was foolish enough to be um, chairman of the school board, you know, in Ohio, and uh, says, do not mention Ellen White in this, in this meeting again. Well, um, um, no, come on, Paul. We really, truly have lost who we are, and uh, we have got to wake up. Well, like I can say, we, we don't believe in the fundamental beliefs. Yes, yes. When you lose identity, uh, yes. what do you have? Want to be everyone to every, everything to everyone. No. No, no. The, the thing is, we have lost. The, the whole point of why we were called into existence yes. in the first place. Right. And we've got to be passionate about this. I mean, the, the Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, and you will be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And this, this brings me to the point that, that, that you're alluding to. You know, somewhere in our Adventist psyche, we have somehow gotten it into our heads that God has called us to be somehow respectable and popular and, and successful and uh, well loved. You know what I'm saying? Well, we we all wish that we, you know, there are the two forms of love that we all desperately need. We need to be loved because that gives us a home. It gives us a starting point. And we need to love because it gives us meaning, direction, purpose. However, we need to keep in mind that we are not in heaven yet. We're on this earth where things that are happening are not happening according to loving kindness and according to common sense, which is extremely uncommon, and according to good sound judgment and reason. Things are happening because somebody wants it so. And usually not for good reason. Usually because they want to be somehow uh, uh, taking advantage of somebody else. And guess who is supposed to carry the work that God wishes we would do. Now, we have seen the awesome work that is being done in us 24 hours a day. But among us, there are all kinds of errors, pathogenic errors that are creeping in in our habits, in our relationships, in our business, in the work, in everything we do. It is diseased with dysfunctionalities at all levels. And what is the answer to that? Well, somebody has to expend energy to do it right. Right does not happen by chance. Good does not happen by chance. It requires effort. It requires personal investment. It requires self-sacrifice. We do. Christ showed us what's required. We do not want that. Well, you could get killed doing that. We, we would like all the good results, but without any personal investment, 
without any personal sacrifice, without any discomfort, in fact, without, you know, ever uh, breaching any leisure. We would prefer just to be able to just issue uh, edicts or wishes a la Trump, and it's all going to somehow magically happen right. And it doesn't. Why? Because reality doesn't work that way. It actually requires personal investment and sacrifice to make good things happen. So, anyway, uh, come back tomorrow or next week, rather, and uh, and we'll go over uh, Dagel's take on evolution. <laughs>